this wonderful panel, about this afternoon's panel. We have four speakers, and I meant to ask Catherine before we started, does that mean these presenters have more time than the people this morning did, or are we leaving more time we for discussion? A oh, it's actually shorter. Okay, I didn't notice that detail. Okay, wonderful. Well, we're just going to be introducing folks. We thought, I, well, we, what we did this morning, I should say, was have everyone present, and then we did, um, you know, questions and discussion together with all of the, uh, all of the panelists. Um, Catherine is going to be giving people from the back a warning at two minutes. So if our presenters could be cognizant of that and keep an eye on her as you're talking so that we can keep things on schedule. Sounds great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have to give you an opportunity to add anything. Sorry. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm really excited to see these different, there we have four different papers coming from four different disciplinary perspectives, mm -hmm. all bridged under the umbrella of education. And so it's really exciting to see um, to ha see how this work will end up in conversation. Absolutely. So our first presenter is Josh Thunderlittle from the Department of History, who will be speaking on the use of Lakota sovereignty to protect water resources. Thank you. So where are we were they stayed in the audience? Oh, they can have a question. Yeah. Okay. So we can, I'm happy to stay up here. Oh, okay. <laughs> we don't need to be up here. <laughs> You're welcome to sit up here. This morning, people went back to their seats, but whatever you like. It's you will eventually come back up here. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. All right. Hello, hello. All right. wash day. Good afternoon, everybody. Josh Rakia Sisila Machia Polo. Um, my name is Josh Thunderlittle, a uh, member of the Oglala Lakota Nation. That is from, well, Pine Ridge, South Dakota. And, but I grew up here in Palm Springs, California, about an hour that way on Kuya territory. And before I present, we'd just like to recognize the Tongva, Serrano, and uh, Kuya territories that we are currently on. I've grown up around the territories, and they include me on their, um, I guess, tribal ways and just really bridging and making a community effort here at the university and outside of it. So I just would like to acknowledge that. But I will be talking about um, now Lakota sovereignty and face of the Dakota Access Pipeline, particularly revisiting the 1851 1868 Fort Laramie treaties. So far, that's what I've been looking at for my dissertation, um, trying to really see how water is informed through Lakota perspectives and knowledge. In 2016, the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline brought together the largest indigenous gathering in history. Resistance camps rested along the Minnesoce. The Minnesoce is a Lakota word for the Missouri River. Uh, and along the Minnesoce and the Sheti Shakowin territories. The Sheti Shakowin, or Shakowin is the Lakota, Dakota, and Nakota nations, which are primarily now in North and South Dakota, but they would you know, travel all over the Northern Plains and until what is current day Canada. Included in these camps was the Red Warrior Camp, the Sheti Shakowin Camp, and the Sacred Stone Camp. Uh, history embedded in this area, and specifically in the water, reaffirmed the presence of Native peoples. The common phrase of the recent struggle is many Wachoni, which explains that, um, it translates to water is life. It was widely spread through social media and in various communities. The struggle to maintain clean water is universally in, in many Native nations, not just in the United States, but outside. But that was the critical aspect a lot of people were trying to miss is that it became really centered around water, but it was an issue of sovereignty because the, for, um, the treaties made between the Shetisha Cohen and the United States is what defined that area. The area where the pipeline crosses is not in the present day reservation boundaries of the Standing Rock Sioux Tribe, but it does cross unceded territory according to the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. Uh, both the treaties tried to restructure what it meant for Lakota people to have connections to their lands. Unchi Maka, which is the Lakota phrase for earth, has been denied because of this movement and the ability to take proper care according to the original instructions of my people and also the various other nations that have used the Missouri River as a place for trade and sustaining their life. As an Oglala Lakota and a member of the Sheti Shakowin, I was really trying to understand how to write history from a Lakota perspective. And from where my community, how they raised me, I turned to some of my family. And I just want to say that I don't claim that these are my interpretations of the original instructions 
and I represent my community as a voice and an individual why not everybody may not agree with me this is what I have to say uh, I use uh, Linda Smith's um, framework decolonizing a book on uh, indigenous reclamation, uh, re, uh, trying to reclaim histories and knowledge, decolonizing methodologies to deconstruct Western notions of sovereignty. Uh, really critical work. She's a Maori scholar in New Zealand to really deconstruct what it means to be an indigenous person in the academy and what it means to deconstruct knowledge in our communities. I also looked at Eva Garut, who's a sociologist professor who's Cherokee, and the idea of radical indigenism, meaning you look to the roots of Native tradition to try and understand our history from the way we say it and have been doing it. Uh, so I spoke to my Lexi, which is his uncle in Lakota. My uncle lives on Pine Ridge Indian Reservation, which is about six hours south of Sandy Rock. And he's a member of the Little family. He's a cultural knowledge bearer of Lakota teachings. He means understandings of the original instructions in Lakota language. So I asked him right around the time of the Dakota Access Pipeline. I was still an undergrad here. It was my fourth year. And I was seeing all the terror and the violence on Facebook through a lot of the live feeds, friends that went there, and people. I have an uncle who also lives in Standing Rock, uh, Chase Iron Eyes. So I asked him, well, on discussions of sovereignty, how do Lakota people conceive of it? Because a lot of people were talking about the treaty rights, but what existed before the treaties is what I was really trying to engage with. So he told me that Inya, which is one of the creators of the original creator of Lakota people, gave their life, because I think it's a non-female, non-male uh, entity, so I will call them them or they, Use all the power and place the people on the land, and it was the blood of Inya that made the water blue and the sky blue. And after explaining the gift of life through water, he stated that well, Lakota also encapsulates the treaty made with the white buffalo calf woman, which is another origin story from Lakota people. According to the first teachings of the white buffalo calf woman, as understood, Lakota created a treaty with her, and also non human entities, hence water and also uh, animals. I also spoke to another person I recently met over at New Mexico. I was at a conference at the University of New Mexico. His name is Louis Grassrope. He's from the Lower Brule Sioux tribe. And he says when the treaty councils met, they thought that both sides were being honest with each other. And that's what the white buffalo calf woman presented to Lakota people, the virtue of being honest with one another and protecting the community. Lakota people have had to accommodate into modern forms of culture and sovereignty through surviving a term that Anishinaabe scholar Gerald Visner coined when theorizing on responses to colonialism from native people. While well, Lakota is an example of survivance, the influence of sovereignty through the United States is a settler colonial structure that is not inclusive of well, Lakota theory, meaning it is based on lies and deceit, trying to restructure how Lakota people conceive of their relationships, if not only with each other, but with water and land. There's been mention of Wola Kota in history in the academy, particularly in terms of friendship. Historian Jeffrey Osler states that Wola Kota is the abstract meaning for peace or friendship. While it does mean being friendly, it is true, but it doesn't look at it as an epistemological reference or a framework for looking at the past. A reinterpretation of Lakota responses to colonialism through Lakota and guided by the white buffalo calf woman and Inya provides a new way of understanding what it means to be sovereign. Sovereignty is power, but with that power, the responsibility of supporting the community is ingrained in that, and it's very base of what it means to be sovereign for Theo Sheti Shekowin. To trace the opposing forms of sovereignty, I've been researching and looking at the doctrine of discovery to explain the relationships and land claims of the United States. Uh, I looked at Robert J. Miller. He uh, is an Eastern Shawnee tribal judge. The Eastern Shawnee people are from Oklahoma, and his tribe is in Oklahoma. And Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson didn't necessarily purchase the right to um, the land. He purchased the right to discovery. And I just realized, I forget I'm using slides. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, yeah, Standing Rock. And here we go. Lakota sovereign relationships. Pete Samhain is a Lakota word for white buffalo calf woman. And Iya. Um, no. He used it to lay claim over Louisiana. Oh, over Lakota, Dakota, Nakota territories, which is in the north. So on the northern aspect of it, 
that's where um, it was the first, I would say, contestation between the United States and Lakota, Seti Shakoan, contesting ideas of what constitutes sovereignty. And Thomas Jefferson's not being an honest person, according to old Lakota theory. He's um, being deceitful and saying he discovered it, but how can you discover something when there's already people who are present who have had a long um, presence in that land and will be there for time immemorial? Uh, after Thomas Jefferson purchased the title of discovering the land in 1804, he hired Meriwether Lewis and William Clark to inform Lakota people that they're going to be governed by Jefferson pretty much like a father. They would call Thomas Jefferson Tankashala or try to refer to him as that because Tankashala means grandfather or a, it's a respectable title in Lakota culture, like elder. And the Doctrine of Discovery is the source of the United States' claim to Asheti Shakoan territories. And once Lewis and Clark had attempted to restructure Lakota governance in terms of land and water, they turned them around saying, we don't think that and we don't want your gifts and they were frustrated when they called them a vile and miscreant race so in 1846 so going forward about 40 years the Sichangu Lakota which is another branch of the Lakota people which means the burnt thigh and the Ogallala which are mine which means they scatter their own want a payment for the traveling of settlers in their territories the deforestation and the killing of buffalo United States military responded by constructing the Fort Laramie Treaty Agreements and the fort itself, where they met. Not only were Ashati Shakoan present at this meeting, but tens of thousands of Native people flocked to this area. The Arikara, the Mandan, the Hidatsa, the Crow, Gross Venture, Blackfeet, Assiniboine, Shoshone, Arapaho, and Cheyenne all met to sign the treaty. Now, the issue with treaty signing, it looked at men. Six men came forward representing various nations. And one person then came up to speak on behalf of everybody, and his name was Mato Wahui, which means conquering bear, translating into English. It's a settler colonial tactic to place all the leadership in one person, and because the community spoke to everybody, the women, the men, and even alternative gendered people, like uh, the Wingte, which is a third gender in Lakota people. They all had a right to be honest with each other and understand what is at stake when you're discussing land claims and rights to water? The treaty specified the territories of each tribe called for intertribal peace and recognized the right of the United States to build railroads, military posts, and respect for immigrants to have safe passage. When the treaty council met, they brought the uh, pipe of the white buffalo calf woman, believing that the United States was being honest as the Lakota people were too. Most recently, Nick Estes, a member of the Lower Bull, Lower Bull Sioux Tribe, who's also a professor of American Indian Studies, wrote that indigenous resistance has never stopped. And that is true because in these treaty negotiations, it was a form of resistance. They were working with the United States government with the understanding that life was changing and they needed to be able to respond. And particularly with the Minnesota, the Missouri River, it was a major source of trade in many native nations Ashati Shakoan and all the ones I listed that met with the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty signings came together and understood that it's a passageway for all of them to share that space. But the United States did not want to. They wanted to land claim and make sure that Britain didn't have any more power over that area. The Lakota people drew from a local theory with the representatives from the United States government in treaty meetings, believing the treaty commissioners had represented what they said. But the United States thought it was only temporary, despite the fact that treaties are the supreme law of the land. Framing water sovereignty through Wolokota will protect water, foster relationships to protect the environment. And that's been seen with the Dakota Access Pipeline resistance along the Minnesota, and, uh, the Minnesota Lake Missouri. The relationships developed in these camps. They shared food, they shared water, and that is being honest with each other. Non-native people also come and shared their experiences and wanted to support the Sheti Shakoan any way they could to promote indigenous forms of sovereignty. Lakota logic can be used to address the capitalistic efforts of desecrated sacred territories, in this particular case, water. And, and also Lakota theory, the idea of being Wasichu. Wasichu now in current days kind of goes towards meaning white people, but originally that's not what it meant. It means take care of the fat and being greedy. 
So in Lakota logic, American people were being greedy and trying to restructure how we conceived of water. Yeah. So for reference, this is the 1851 Fort Laramie Treaty. It was Wyoming, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Montana. And that was the uh, what is it? the uh, boundaries of the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. And then going into the Dawes Act in 1889, it decentralized all these agreements, but Lakota people still held truth to these because, well, Lakota says, we were being honest and we want you to honor it. And that's what was missing in the media and in many discussions about Standing Rock is the reference to these treaties and sovereignty. Water is a relative of the Shakohan and other tribal people. It's become a disposable object in the capitalist system and has been abused to gain economic profit. The Dakota Access Pipeline has leaked already, I believe, two times. Not major spills, but and it, it happened. And uh, Energy Transfer Partners, which was the company based out of Texas that decided to build the pipelines, that it would not leak, but it did. So we'll look at the phrase, the life uh, phrase for living a good life and being honest with one another is a decolonial practice that reflects on the past, is applied to the present, and guides the next seven generations. Native people are always centering around the next seven generations and thinking what will happen to our you know, grand great 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 granddaughters, and it's a universal concept amongst native people. I don't spoke for other native nations, but that's what I have had discussions with in community spaces, academic spaces, and within my family household. The past is tied to our future. It will help create a viable solution to not only help native people but any person living in America. So. Sharing this theory and being able to work alongside any American that lives along the uh, Missouri River is important because it's just not an Indian issue. It's an issue that affects all people. And wait. Water is life. environment. So today I'm going to talk about my paper about uh, how teacher evaluation affecting student performance. So let's start with this map here. So this map is showing in the United States where they use a student, student growth measure in their teacher evaluation. So student growth measure here is just basically we are uh, measuring the student gain in test score and how much the student has improved in test score compared to the last year. And we're gonna measure that and we're gonna attribute that to the teachers uh, contribute. So the uh, 37 states as of 2018 are using this policy in evaluating teachers. And since this policy is nationwide, I would like to look at how this policy is actually benefiting the students. So here, why we are always uh, talking about teachers, because teachers matter to students. Of course, teachers, we all have like important teacher in our life, but first of all, teacher has high impact on the student's learning. So when we look at the math and reading score that we have a, a standardized test that we can measure the student's achievement, that there are many research that I have like a graph so, to show that if you have an effective teacher, that student's performance has 
increase in math, like 0.2 standard deviation, and then for reading is less, but 0.1 standard deviation. So here, it looks small if we would know the if you look at the 0.1, but it's similar to the effect of having a smaller classroom for the students. So it is really high uh, impact on students. Not only that, test score, yes, but then beyond the test score, we uh, can see that teacher has an impact on students' later life outcome. So Raj Chetty in Stanford University with his colleague used the IRS data, so you can say it's nearly population data, to figure out that if student had an effective teacher in their uh, school, they're more likely to graduate from high school enroll in college, and also they're more likely to be employed. And at the end, they calculated that they will have higher life income. How much? If you replace a teacher from the bottom 5% effectiveness to the average one, then that student will have 250K lifetime income more. So that was striking. That's why all the educators and policymakers are focusing on how to have a good teacher. So here I was keep talking about effective teacher and how we measure the effectiveness of teacher. What we think is we can measure that with all the observable characteristics we can see. For example, if teacher has more experience, they will be more effective. If teacher has higher degrees, such as master degree, we think that they're more effective and other personal development, licensure, everything. So it is true. It is related to becoming more effective teacher, but we cannot say that that is the measure of how we measure quality of teaching of teachers. So what uh, in, the, in the classroom, what we do is first, before using the student growth measure, what school used was using the classroom observation. Means supervisor, principal comes to the class and observe the how a teacher do in the classroom and write down. It's often subjective and it's only giving you satisfactory, unsatisfactory rating. So it was difficult to measure actually how these teachers are doing and we cannot see the performance growth, productivity growth over the year. But then with the data quality comes in and federal uh, policy of race to top policy focusing on the teacher's accountability system. Uh, uh, educator and policymakers start calculating the value added measure. It's just measure of student growth. Again, we're comparing the student's test score, previous test score, and this test score, and if teacher taught this student for a year, that growth is accounted to that teacher. So this serves as one part of the objective measure of teacher's effectiveness. And there's a lot of debate whether using this score is good for teachers or teacher, we are pushing teacher to teaching to the test, or is this policy makes teacher to focus on only getting the high score on their student? So there's a lot of debate, but I'm not gonna talk about that. My focus here is a lot of states already using this policy. And I wanna know that whether this policy is helping students to improve their test score or achievement. So I will use uh, Ohio's data. So Ohio is giving me the perfect setting of studying this uh, subject because they had a pilot program before every school in the state using this policy, using the value added score for evaluating teacher. And also Ohio's uh, teacher doesn't have the union. So I think it's giving me the perfect setting of just looking at the policy effect on students. So I can address that my research question is, is this helping student? So data, I will go briefly. I'm using Ohio school report card. Uh, it's from 2005 to 2016 then I can see from this data, I have the percentage of students in each school who's in each category of five ordered category. So they are category of advanced, accelerated, proficient, basic, and limited. And I can see the number of students in this category. So I can see how this policy is changing the composition of students in the school. And also, because this is a categorical data, aggregate data, I back up with another data is coming from Stanford Education Data Archive, which is giving me the test score, estimated test score, and growth measure of students so I can support the argument that I have with the Ohio School Report Card. 
I cannot avoid the empirical strategy because economists, but I will make it really simple here. So essentially, I'm using difference in difference. What it means that I'm comparing the policy before policy and after policy outcome. So here, policy is using the value added score. So that is kind of sort of the experimental uh, happening to me. So I will just compare before and after. But if I just only do this, I will just maybe catching up the trend, picking up the trend. If I compare 2005 to 2016, there was already trend of the student test score increasing. I will maybe just capturing that. So I use another round of differencing, means I will use the pilot. So there was a pilot program, means only 150 out of 600 school district were participating in this program before statewide implement. So I will compare treatment group, which is pilot participant schools, versus control group who did it. So these two rounds of differencing, I can have the causal estimate how this policy affects students. So I will just jump to the finding. What I found is interesting. So my prior thought, this policy at least bump up the student's test score to the high because teacher wanted to improve their teaching and then it will uh, project to the student, but on average, I don't find any effect. It means the policy is not hurting student, neither benefiting student. So I was like, it was against my prior, so I was looking into deeper. What I found is it was, there was a distributional change. Means that the student who are at the top category in the test score distribution, who are good student, the percentage of students were decreasing and also the percentage of students who are at the bottom distribution are decreasing. And they all move to the middle, which is proficient category, but they're on the average. So I was thinking, what's going on here? And then because there was no average effect, I was thinking, is this a hurting student? Because they're, it's clearly hurting the student who are at the top. And this is making sense now, because the teachers are now focusing on the kids who has highest potential to have a growth. Now they're evaluated by student growth, right? So if they, they're less caring about students who are already doing good, they're caring about the student at the bottom uh, distribution so they can have large score on their terms. And that's why those students are moving on the top. On average, it's trade-off. I don't see any effect. So my research project right now, after this, I'm trying to get the individual level data. And I want to see actually is this is welfare gain or welfare loss means that is student benefiting from the bottom is that is like actually helping student or is it student hurting from the top is like losing we are losing welfare from there so that's my another project I will pursue at the end of my PhD thank you. to introduce her? Go for it. Well, I'm on the dissertation committee. Oh, perfect. Rubia, uh, Rubia Kumar. Um, let's learn about presentation in U.S. history and government textbooks. She's a doctoral student in the Education Society and Culture Program and the Graduate School. Hello everyone, my name is Rabia and um, I, have, I have been working, I have started working on my dissertation, I was just collecting data, so I wanted to share my first set of data which is on textbook representation of Muslims. Um, so the reason I focus on textbooks in my dissertation along with interviews of students, uh, of Muslim students, is because textbooks play an important role in our schooling. And the first time we ever um, learn about people is through the textbooks that we are exposed to from the beginning from our public schooling. Um, it's not just textbooks, I'll add, it's also I mean, we're exposed to under, uh, learning about other people and cultures through media. But textbooks tend to have this um, 
are perceived more as a trusted source of knowledge, as um, having information that is more objective, um, factual, and neutral. But research shows that they may contain inaccurate and stereotypical information about groups of people, about religions, and about um, cultures. So, um, and what that does is it feeds into a master narrative. And what I me uh, mean by master narratives is that there's this Eurocentric narratives present in our textbook that focus on a Eurocentric history, but not the history of people um, of people of color. Um, and of people who are not part of the dominant religions. Um, and then also I want to add that when I'm talking about master narratives, um, research shows that the focus, a lot of the focus is on presenting the, Amer um, the U.S. as America as exceptional and um, one that has, uh, you know, is a peacekeeper internationally and a beacon of hope which supports their economic and military interventions. And I also use um, textbooks because they're, um, they're a primary source used by, a primary instructional source used by um, teachers to um, teach. And then also they have an immense power in shaping how we view each other and how, what students learn about other people and um, our history. So um, my research questions for this um, particular study is that in, to understand how Islam, Muslims, and Muslim majority regions and Muslim Americans are discussed in high school textbooks, but also how do textbook narratives define the relationship between the United States and the, and, and the Muslim world, while also looking at how they inform students' ethnic and religious identities. So I looked at some um, previous research and um, they have the Predominant overarching theme is that there are oversimplified master narratives presented about um, people in terms of misrepresentation and also underrepresentation, where um, people of color are discussed and their histories are discussed in a passive manner and they're not considered as active um, participants. And um, what this does is it, the, the curriculum ends up, the textbooks end up re representing the enduring racism that are present in our society, which make their way into the textbooks that we use, uh, meaning that the textbooks are not separate from the society, they're produ produced in a society, and those particular understandings from that time about race and racism are translated, are put forth through the textbooks that are used. And then also um, some authors present a work that pan-ethnic representations are prevalent in textbooks, which uh, means like when we're talking about Asian Americans, it kind of removes um, discussions about specific groups and how their um, political and social experiences in the US, and rather clumps them into this monolithic group um, and um, results in a form of erasure of their identity. And then also when I uh, looked at specific research that talk about Muslim representation, there were very limited narratives. There's not a lot of space dedicated to talking about Muslims, but whatever space is dedicated to Muslims is primarily in times of conflict, uh, particularly terrorism, and um, when talking about oil or aggression and whatnot. And then also terrorism itself is framed as a problem that is uh, a problem for the US and the Western nations, but not something that also affects um, those uh, uh, people who are in those re regions and also military intervention by the Westerners and how that impacts them is not discussed. So the conceptual frameworks that I'm using in my dissertation, the overarching one is critical race theory, which examines the intersection of race, racism, and other forms of subordination, the structural and cultural foundations of the United States, which means that there is race and racism embedded in our daily life, and we start with that recognition. And um, then I, uh, the research that uses, um, educational research that uses critical race theory is, um, examines the inequitable educational experiences, keeping the racism and race in mind in the structural and con cultural foundations of the schooling system as well. And then I particularly draw from uh, Cheryl Harris's whiteness as property to talk about the ways that uh, whiteness is privileged in the textbooks in the ways that Eurocentric histories are presented. Um, and whiteness um, 
has historically given public and private entitlements to a certain group of people, to white people. And that has been historically supported through our laws and policies in education, in housing, and even in what we see in our textbooks. So some other intersecting concepts that I'm using. You might wonder why I'm using critical race theory to talk about Muslims, because um, I'm coming from this uh, framework that Muslims are also racialized in our society, even though it's a religion, because there are certain uh, racial meanings that are extended to them by the way that they look, uh, the characteristics of the group, and racialization doesn't just mean a uh, person's race, but also certain practices and uh, relationships that are developed in, our, uh, in, in the world. Um, and then also draw from Edward Said's Orientalism um, to discuss this, uh, the, the ways the textbook exaggerates the differences between like, the Eastern world or the Muslim world in this case and the West, and ideological hegemony to talk about the, the set of beliefs that are overarching and um, they're enforced and reinforced through power, those people who do have the power to define what we believe, what we see, like for example, media, politicians, and also textbooks. So um, the primary method that I use is critical discourse analysis. I look at language uh, used in the textbooks, particularly how uh, it reinforces power relations. And uh, I look at the overt messages that are presented. Um, by that, I mean I look at the text, read the text carefully, and look at images, and also look at the primary source documents that are provided. And then um, also look at the hidden curriculum, what is set between the lines and what is omitted, why it may be omitted, and what does that mean for um, the type of official knowledge that's being constructed, the official narratives, and how that reinforces a cultural hegemony that is Eurocentric um, and marginalizing. So I use open coding and line by analysis, um, line by line analysis to look at all the references of how Muslims are brought up, um, issues related to them, and Islam. So these were my two, uh, two data sources. Um, so the, my interviewees, schools use these books specifically. So that's why I focus on those two. Um, there are the Magruder's American Government, the American Vision, uh, the American Vision used in 11th grade, and the American Government one is the 12th grade one, and they're both 2006 editions. So some of my findings, um, they're not complete, but some that I'll talk about today are that um, Muslims and Islam are generally come up in areas where US is epitomized as uh, the one with the freedom, the liberty, democracy, and peace narrative. And in that, this, uh, these ideals, the American ideals, are in threat, uh, are threatened by terrorism, and that terrorism discourse only focuses, and I mean only focuses on Muslims and Muslim majority regions. And then that, in a way, justifies the need for military intervention to protect US interests, and not just US interests in terms of security, but also politically and economically. Uh, when talking about oil, but I'm not gonna get into oil much. Um, so I'm sure that's a little difficult to read, so I'm going to um, go over these, I'm going to read them off to you. So the first one um, from the government text is uh, in that the U.S. is described as committed to building a democracy in a strife-torn country, uh, referring to Iraq, and Iraq, Iraq is re referred to as a challenge because it has no history of free institutions upon which a democracy might be built nor any unifying tradition. So in this example, um, the US describes, uh, I mean, the textbook authors described Iraq as strife torn and uh, like kind of like they don't know how to deal with it and that it's a challenge um, presenting a clear us versus them that they don't, because they haven't had those history of free institutions, they don't have this um, place to begin uh, building these democratic institutions in a way referring back to American exceptionalism that we do, um, there are certain ideas that are part of the Western society that the Eastern world doesn't have and it pre presents a challenge for the West. Um, so in a way this is also reinforcing Orientalist belief that privilege Western um, institutional design and thought as better. And then the second example is from the American vision and that um, I cite Donald Rumsfeld and former President Bush are cited. 
um, saying that uh, talking about free people, freedom's home and defender when talking about the U.S. and in, in relation to terrorists. And they both en engage in this American exceptionalism narrative in their speeches. Um, and the textbook does the same in perpetuating this by, ad uh, by adding on how the U.S. interventions are help. They do actually go and help um, where they invade, Af whether it's Afghanistan or if it's um, Iraq, to help them create um, peaceful governments or engage in a peacemaking process. But then they change. But then they add on to this narrative by talking about how those troops are still in danger, though, because they're in that place. They're open to, um, they're susceptible to being attacked by terrorists and radicals. Once again, going back to um, this ideological hegemony of American exceptionalism. So here are just some images that I pulled out. One is, the first one is a Moroccan woman um, uh, pumping water from technology that was provided by the United, State, the United States. And the second one is soldiers boarding a trans transport helicopter while preparing to liberate Kuwait because Iraq was going in and the US was threatened that they were gonna take their oil and the, uh, the US would have, you know, the access to oil would be more difficult, so they were going to go in and liberate Kuwait. Um, and then the third example is that U.S. soldiers um, are helping an Afghani um, girl who was hurt probably by the war, but they, there's no context provided in terms of how um, or any information provided as in how military intervention, uh, intervention of the U.S. and um, the Western allies affects their lives. So the next one is theme was terrorism discourse focuses on Muslims. Um, and both textbooks talk about um, former President Bush's preemptive war strike. Um, the, the, the American government one ends the narrative that there was, they end the, uh, the story with um, that Iraq had, uh, that President Bush thought Iraq had um, weapons of mass destruction and that they were in violation of the ceasefire agreement during the Gulf War that was set during the Gulf, after the Gulf War. Um, but they don't go into how that actually, um, they don't go into how, uh, that, that there weren't any weapons of mass destruction. But the second book does go into that the UN went in and they said that there were no weapons of mass destruction, but then, um, but then, um, but then uh, that President Bush invaded anyway, and they didn't find it. And then once again, they were um, the nar the narrative shifts back to the radicalism and terrorism that is in those areas. Um, so I, I find that that's very important. That following the argument with uh, that there is still violence in this territory, despite no weapons of mass destruction, because it reinforces the Muslim uh, area, Muslims as a threat. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead to the next one. And in these images, the first one was a map that shows all um, forms of terrorism committed by Muslims. And the second image is, uh, the caption reads, anti-American sentiment is common in Muslim and Arab nations today. And this is a picture from a Pakistani um, Islamist group holding a, carrying a poster of bin Laden. And the third one is about division in the Middle East where um, uh, it, it, we're at the West Bank in Palestine and the caption reads that in response to terrorist attacks, Israel has begun um, building a barrier. So again, presenting the Muslim world as a danger and a threat to the Western, Western um, ideals. So I'm gonna go on into my conclusions now. So the dominant narratives in these textbooks still perpetuates Eurocentric ideas. And the old textbooks that I, um, I mean, I didn't look at old textbooks, but the, the new ones also say that the, the similar narratives continue about stereotyping the Muslim, uh, Muslims as a threat, and how that in turn protects whiteness as property by normalizing particular ideas about Muslims in order to justify um, economic and military interventions. And in, in addition to that, textbooks also serve as the official knowledge, as I mentioned before, um, which perpetuates the racialization and stereotyping of Muslims and it feeds into Orientalist notions about Muslims and, um, um, and then also supports 
the the status quo and with the status quo right now which supports the power structures and relations that remain unquestioned and not changing that while erasing and trivializing the experiences of Muslims but then also experiences of people of color in general in these textbooks. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Hello. Um, I have tried to undercaffeinate so that I don't speak quickly through the presentation. But if I do, I will look at your panicked faces and try to slow down. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, my dissertation topic, which looks at the experiences of undergraduate disabled students of color. Um, arrow keys. Uh, yeah, so it's based on my dissertation work. I'm very early in the data collection stage. At this point, I have one participant, so I will be focusing on her story uh, today in the presentation. Um, and also focusing on how a racist, ableist, um, racist ableist framework could potentially be useful for understanding the experiences of undergraduate students of color, uh, disabled undergraduate students of color. And you'll see that I use this term disabled with the slash, and that comes from um, Anima, Ferry, and Connor, who do discrit or disability critical race theory. And it's to draw attention to the fact that disability, like race, is socially constructed. And that does not mean that there aren't differences in ability, but that the meanings we prescribe to them are things that people make. Uh, so just to give you a bit of background on what my research questions are, so I'm just focusing on my first research question and my first research sub-question, and this is what informed the presentation today. Um, so the first question is, what are the experiences of students of color with disabilities when interacting with faculty, administration, and peers in institutions of higher education? Um, and the particular sub-question I'm focusing on throughout the presentation that I'm attempting to address is to what extent does ableism, um, and if you're not familiar with the term ableism, it refers to uh, valuing able-bodiedness over disability. Um, to what extent does ableism and or racism, as well as sexism and other isms, shape the educational and social experiences of students of color with disabilities on college and university campuses? Uh, so again, this is a preliminary theoretical framework. It actually came out of discussion with Dr. Rita Coley during my oral exam, and I was talking in my oral exam about how I wanted to talk about racism and ableism together, but the language didn't quite exist to address these things as one, not one phenomenon, but a more nuanced phenomenon. So rather than just talking about racism and ableism, how do we sort of combine these two experiences, um, these two isms, together in a way that would meaningfully address uh, the experiences of multiply marginalized people. Um, so it weaves together critical race theory, disability critical race theory, um, in particular this uh, notion of ability as property. So like uh, Rabia discussed whiteness as property, ability is also a form of property, um, and racist nativism. Uh, and if you're not familiar with the racist nativism framework, essentially that is the idea that people who are US born is typically associated with white and whiteness, whereas othering is a process um, involving people of color. Um, and the goal is to address the legal and historical relationship between race and ability. Uh, in particular, that the construct of disability has frequently been used to marginalize not only people of color, but also queer folks, women, um, and other marginalized groups. Um, as a tool of oppression while reinforcing privilege and power in middle and upper class whites. So this is a working definition, it might change, um, but right now how I'm conceptualizing this idea of racist ableism is that it's particular forms of ableism informed by racist attitudes and beliefs which dehumanize persons of color based on actual or perceived or inversely 
um, a lack of perceived disability, thereby reinforcing the relationship between whiteness and ability. Um, I want to point out that it's almost impossible to talk, not talk about race when we're talking about ableism and the idea of able-bodiedness, because that concept is also race and gendered. So when we're thinking of the able-bodied person or what that ideal person would look like, that would typically be uh, white, uh, it would be a male, um, and it would be someone who's able-bodied. So these are very much um, constructed in relation to other isms. So these, um, I'm going to present some of my preliminary findings, um, basically two excerpts from um, my research participant whose pseudonym is Tiffany, uh, which she selected herself. Um, data was collected over the course of two 90-minute informal interviews. Um, so we met on two separate occasions. In the first interview, we talked about her experience in K through 12, family background. Um, and then the second interview, we focused more on her experience in higher education. It wasn't quite as neat as that, but basically that was the gist of the two interviews. Um, so Tiffany identifies as black or African American. Um, she was diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury or a TBI in early adulthood. So she was not someone who was disabled growing up. That was something she acquired later in life and also acquired that label later in life. She was a transfer student from a two-year college to a four-year college, um, and she's a STEM major. Uh, so I'm going to present just two, um, not vignettes, but two stories that she shared with me. Um, and one's involving peer interactions, and the other's involving um, interactions with faculty, or not faculty, more um, college staff. So I'm not going to get too much into the analysis until the end of the vignettes, um, but I'm going to share her stories, because I think her words are really powerful uh, by themselves. Um, so the first story, Essentially, Tiffany and I were talking about her interactions with her peers, and we were talking about high school, but she also brought up this is a problem she's had in college as well, and the way that people perceive her. Um, so a little bit of context on what she's addressing in this question. So basically, it was something along the lines of, how do you feel other people perceive you or perceived you? So Tiffany says, so they would perceive me as ghetto, and they would think, that I'm this, you know, ghetto person who doesn't know how to act or conduct herself, you know? So don't really want to be bothered with me. And then there's other students who they, they're just like, she's normal, you know? She's not ghetto, she's, you know. Some people say, I don't really have a speech impediment, like right now, but I know I do. I know some of my words are not clear. I know that I slur and I have retainers. And so it's like, for real guys, so I'll have like these things, not necessarily going against me, but not going for me either, you know. Um, so like, we'll be in a group setting, and then this just happened a few hours ago. We're in a group, and like we're talking about the questions, you know, and she's referring to questions for a uh, group assignment. Um, and it's, I wouldn't say they ignored me, but they would not really, they act like they didn't hear me. That is ignoring, but, but um, they've already built up this exterior barrier. So they're, they don't see me, they don't hear me, you know. My speech, who I am, black girl, you know. So Tiffany's addressing in this passage how in these situations, it's not just that she's a person with a speech impediment or that she's a black woman. It's both of these things um, that are very much part of her experience and how other people are perceiving her and how she's interpreting those interactions. Um, the second one is um, interactions with staff. And this happened while she was at a community college, but it was something that happened when she transferred to her four-year institution as well. So I'm talking about one of these experiences. But this happened to her at least two times that she mentioned, and there were other smaller incidents as well. So um, a little bit of context. So basically, Tiffany was telling me about how she um, had specific incidents with bullying that involved faculty, um, including professors, as well as faculty in terms of staff, or not faculty, but staff at the Disability Services Office. So I asked her if she felt comfortable sharing what those experiences were, and this was her response. Well, actually, a lot of bullying happened with teachers. And like me, between me and my teachers, um, but this one specifically was in the disability office. I was trying I was trying to take my test, and now I'm looking at it. It's like super petty, but one of the, the persons who works there in the, um, he was in charge of the scheduling, and I came. I believe it was 10 minutes earlier or whatever. And I was like trying to get situated to take my test, you know. 
and words were exchanged and it was basically like, no, you can't come in here yet. No, bye, no. It was rude. And like I was emotional already because you know the level of test I was taking, you know, so I was like already emotional from my course load. So when I went in the office, I was just, you know, ready to take my test, but he was being like confrontational, you know, so it was like real bad, real bad. I didn't even take my test. I left out crying, like, and I'm a pretty strong person, but I was crying, yeah, it was. So I asked her what her theory or why she thought um, was going on in this particular interaction, um, and this was her response. My theory, I think it was because they thought I was cheating. Like, I didn't deserve to be given the extra amount of time, or you know, like, because you look at me and you don't think I'm, nothing's wrong unless you see me walking or hear me talking. Hear me talking, you might think. But just at face value, just at looking at me, you don't think that I'm disabled. So they think she's like, you know, getting over on disability. You know, so they'll be nasty to me. Um, so again, this is preliminary work. So these are just some implications and conclusions I have right now. Um, the first is that um, Tiffany's experiences as a multiply marginalized person are complex. And analyzing her experience just through the runs, uh, lens of racism or sexism or ableism doesn't give justice to her experience um, or these particular encounters that she talks about throughout the interviews. Um, her experience as being disabled, black and a woman, are all intertwined. Um, and we need more tools and research that can address that these are not clear cut um, isms. Um, while well, studies have found that disabled students are frequently accused of cheating um, or being given an unfair advantage, Tiffany's experiences were particularly aggressive. And nowhere in the literature have I found um, that a disability services office was the one who was uh, denying her an accommodation. Usually the literature talks about professors or peers making these accusations. But the fact that she's talking about was disability services offices um, were the ones who were giving her the impression she was cheating or she was, didn't deserve that extra amount of time are complicated. Um, and I don't have an exact reason yet as to why that is happening, but that definitely was not something documented in the literature. Um, throughout the interview, so she talks about two experiences. I talked about one, but she talks about um, disability service offices and their professionals being um, nasty, rude, and unprofessional with her, and that all she wanted was a professional exchange uh, where she was able to get her accommodations. And oftentimes, um, when she would push for these accommodations, her resistance was interpreted as defiance, um, which is something I would like to talk about at some point in my research. So racist ableism as a framework um, may lead to more nuanced understandings of how disabled students of color navigate racist and ableist structures in higher education. In particular, forms of ableism, ableism which are informed by racist attitudes and beliefs towards people of color. Um, so in particular, Tiffany's experience as perce um, being perceived as ghetto, but she also brings up that she has a speech impediment. So people are misconstruing, so racist attitudes and beliefs about black people, in particular her as a black woman, lead to people thinking, um, assuming a deficit perspective, um, when in reality she has a speech impediment, STEM major, um, very articulate um, if you give her the time to speak, um, but she found most people weren't patient with her, and that included uh, faculty and professors. And then Tiffany's experiences with hostility with disability services offices for not looking disabled enough, um, and these ideas that, um, in general, these discourses that people of color unfairly gain the system, in particular the collegiate system. So um, her not looking disabled and being a person of color, she believes, um, and I hope to find this in future interviews also, um, that this has to do with this idea that she's gaming the, the system when in reality she just needs these certain accommodations to be able to be successful in the institution. So that is all. Thank you.
Hi everyone. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Um, so I, we were just going to start by sharing just a couple. Um, I had a couple comments or questions that arose as I thought through each of the papers, and then we're going to open it up. And as we open it up. Um, there'll be a mic that will be <laughs> um, used so that we can record the questions um, for our records as well. So please wait for the mic when you have your hand up. Um, so I just wanted to thank all of the, the graduate students for you know, sharing their work with us. They all come from very different lenses and are speaking to really important um, and sometimes contested issues in our educational system. Um, and so it just made me think around um, for the first paper with Josh, um, how the historical and epistemological framing of your research shape land education or how water and land are taught. Um, you know, I'm coming from education, so I think specifically about how young people learn to think about land and respect water and if they are being taught to do those things or not and how that actually contradicts sometimes the, um, the geospatial structures of schools that are very wasteful, so that made me think about that. Um, in the next paper, thinking about when you examine test data as a proxy for learning, how do you account for students, um, for teachers not teaching to the test? Um, and so thinking that if the bottom tier of students are also negatively impacted by this, how might you overlap demographic statistics of race, free lunch eligibility, English learners, special ed, um, to see how who's disproportionately impacted by um, these policies. That was something important that I thought about. Um, for Rabia's, if you were to reimagine Muslim representation in K through 12 curriculum, what would you hope was represented? Um, so thinking about the starting point of um, we're seeing a problematic presentation. So how do what if we were to give recommendations of what we would hope for instead? What would that look like? Does that exist anywhere outside of textbooks and other forms of curriculum? Um, and then for the last paper with Danielle, what are the strengths and insights of multiply marginalized people? What can we do with these insights to improve higher educational experience? So those were just, I'm not expecting them to answer, but those were just some things that came to my mind as I was listening to the papers. But we wanted to actually have them respond to questions that you were all thinking about. So. I guess, okay, uh, you. Um, I, I, it just hit me in the face that, of course, that when you're looking for the mass, the best gain in point, what you would concentrate on the ones that cool. have the, the largest ceiling with which, and then the ones that are already towards that, you would not care about. Not, yeah, that wouldn't be where you'd focusing on yeah you wouldn't uh, and it, and it's just common sense to think about that from a probability statistical standpoint and I just wanted to thank you for bringing that up I mean <laughs> that I've not heard that before and so that's oh, okay. just that's that's uh, I I'm uh, very grateful for that and uh, at this at the same time you think okay well these are the people that need the help yes and so that's that's a real value yes uh, at the same time, you're attenuating, you know, the best and the brightest. Uh, do you have any, you know, just fresh-eyed look at that? How how you'd uh, 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 deal with that uh, dysfunction? I mean, that function dysfunction. Oh, so right now, so I'm thinking like when I think about this policy, of course it makes sense as an economist, like teacher will be strategic to get the highest score. Sure. And then that's why I brought up the question, is this welfare gain in the society or not? And I want to think that this can be going toward the welfare gain, saying that there are so many schools are uh, like uh, hard staffed and teachers are not folk people were worried about teacher will go to the schools with a uh, high score level because they want to teach good uh, kids yeah. like who are like more putting effort in teaching in terms of not test score in, in, uh, in terms of the resource they have the rich schools rich background and students 
But then I think this is a light that we can see that, okay, because this policy might be helping the student who needs more of the teacher who are like a economically disadvantaged student, but they are because they're on the bottom of the test score. Maybe teacher might think that strategically we're gonna go here and then have a high score on that student and that actually helping the student. And I think that's helping the inequality in the educational um, attainment later. That's the two biggest goal, yeah, I, but. Yeah, it's a, it's a, an inter, a, it could be a diagnostic for yes. another level of thought. Yes. Yeah. But I'm trying to get the individual level data to s unfold what is going on there. Yeah, that's you've done enough, though, that it will yeah. a, a lot of eyes, I'm sure. Yes, yeah. that's what I wanted to go. I had a question about the um, the last paper. Which um, is there a is there um, do you think there's a difference between the way in which uh, st say students of color are pers that are asking for services and white students, or is it just, because um, I've had a lot of students who, who have this problem, right, where they have a disability that's not visible, and the way they're perceived is, I'm just wondering, you, you want to make this, um, you want to look at this sort of um, intersection from this sort of like, it's, it's a, but I'm, I'm wondering if you, if the, what the differences are, right? Because it, it seems kind of, um, it seems kind of awful. I mean, it, it's kind of fraught for all disabled, all those with disabilities that aren't visible, right? So in your, in your dissertation, do you look at people with more visible disabilities and is there a difference or? Well, so I do qualitative work, um, and one of the things I wanted to try to avoid was comparing students of color to white students, um, and that not to be held as any sort of norm. Um, but yeah, so disabled students in general do have a lot of trouble accessing resources, and that, that's a problem across racial, gender, socioeconomic groups. Um, but the idea that we know that these racist attitudes and beliefs exist in higher ed and that they wouldn't impact a student of color trying to get accommodations to me seemed like, well, obviously this would because we have a lot of documentation on students of color um, that find that they're encountering hostile racial climates on campus. Um, so an example from a different study, so Banks and Hughes did a study on um, African American males in college, um, and there was a black male participant in their study who had cerebral palsy. And he was finding that people made the assumption that he had cerebral palsy because he was in a gang and he was shocked. Um, and I do not believe, had this been a white participant, that those assumptions would not have been made. Um, and then also, because of the nature of confidentiality with disability, um, if you had a student of color who did not identify what their disability was, and they do not have to, um, according to ADA, that particular assumptions might be made if that was a black male um, student where he might, or she might need, or, so you, you have a black male student who might need to sit closer in the class because of a vision issue, but the teacher might make particular assumptions about what the nature of their disability is. So that's something I'm trying to uncover in my study. Um, there's been a few studies that have done work on students of color in higher ed with disabilities, but most of it's been in K through 12 at this point. Yeah, I guess my question was more about um, visible versus invisible disabilities and, and how it's much more difficult, or if it's more difficult when it's not visible. What would be more difficult? Accessing the services you, you need. Um, I think there's a different set of barriers when you have an invisible disability than if you have a physical disability. So those would be different processes. So I think each, whether it's visible or invisible, you're gonna encounter certain barriers um, that are gonna look different from each other. But certainly if you have an invisible disability, there's that burden of proof that maybe if you were a wheelchair user that you wouldn't have to necessarily 
um, share your disability because people could make particular assumptions based on that you're in a wheelchair versus if you have an invisible disability um, that's sort of left up to interpretation or um, you might be forced to disclose so that you can receive certain accommodations, um, which is the case in the literature too, that a lot of um, students have to end up disclosing so that they can get appropriate accommodations. <laughs> well, first, I want to say thank you to all four of you. These were just terrific, terrific papers. Thank you all so much. Um, my question is for Ravia. Um, this isn't your unit of analysis, I know, but um, because it is for me, it jumped out at me about gender. And so in particular, I noticed that the illustrations that you showed us from the books, um, the, for the first point you made, the illustrations of the U.S., um, you know, being the beneficent bestower of good things, you know, the recipients were Muslim women or females. So it's a girl and a, and a woman, I think. Mm -hmm. And then for the second set of illustrations where the illustrations were about Muslims as terrorists, those were all male. Mm -hmm. So I wondered if that was just what happened to be the ones that you, you chose to select for this presentation or if that is, um, if that is a real theme in the um, primary sources. That is one of the themes. I mean, something that I um, didn't discuss in my presentation. But there are not that many images to begin with with Muslims. They do show up randomly sometimes. So when I checked the index, I looked at every single word and found, you know, the images that I did. They were not in like um, chapters where there were discussions about Muslims. And in terms of Muslim women, those are the only two. Uh, there's no more, um, and there are more about terrorism, but not specifically images of people that might be conceived as terrorists, but of soldiers who are uh, present in these areas, or even in the U.S. when they're going around airports, uh, or when the Coast Guards um, coast, uh, are going um, are on bridges or protecting the U.S. and the need for um, more security to build more military might. Um, I feel like that is m being justified through through the images a lot more, um, which I think, again, perpetuates this terrorism discourse and the need for more militarism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think you were here this morning for the, for the morning session that was um, about the um, uh, Muslim women in fashion. Mm -hmm. And the statistics there about um, that Muslim women in the U.S. are most likely the are more often the targets of anti-Muslim um, sentiment and having the veils pulled off and that kind of thing. I just think it, it's interesting that that's true at the same time that the school the textbooks are portraying Muslim women in as helpless mm -hmm. and and of needing help. Mm -hmm. That's just an odd juxtaposition, mm -hmm. and I wonder mm -hmm. if you have anything to say about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it is, it is a good juxtaposition, um, in, in the textbooks and, I mean, what I've been reading and in my interviews, too, Muslim, um, a lot of my Muslim females, uh, students, uh, interviewees did identify themselves as, um, uh, that, that they're perceived more as helpless by some of their teachers, but not a lot, but with a shift in narrative and more um, figures available in mainstream media, it does help. So like Hassana's um, presentation with these women and their visibility, it helps them um, make spaces for themselves in, in schools. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I mean, just to comment, I think, isn't there also a stereotype that Muslim women are oppressed by mm -hmm. the government and are needing to be saved? Mm -hmm by U.S. ideology, so mm -hmm. that might contribute yeah. or connect. Oh, yes. Yeah, and just to jump in on Margaret's question, I thought some of the, the data that Hassana shared this morning that was quantitative was interesting because the qualitative data with Muslim women in America consistently shows that they have far more experiences with people offering them unwanted assistance, trying to liberate them, help them, get them out of uh, relationships, strangers on the bus approaching them, asking them if they need help, things like that, as opposed to actual physical 
um, forms of, uh, of violence that would be considered hate crimes. So I, I thought that was interesting because there seems to be perhaps a pretty big divide between what crime statistics are saying and what qualitative researchers are finding. Would that be okay? And my question is for Josh. I was glad to hear uh, more of your uh, paper from our seminar. And I was wondering if you could talk about more about your relative's role as a carrier of knowledge and if, he's, if, uh, if those uh, people in those roles are having self-reflexive conversations in the, in the way that you are about um, transmitting knowledge um, outside of the academy. Uh, yeah, uh, my uncle Jake, he's just real, um, I don't know, he's in the community. I know he's been there, he got his master's and undergraduate degree over in South Dakota and working for, I think, the tribal offices currently. It's just shared knowledge. There's usually one individual or a couple of people that participate in the ceremonies and listen to the elders and certain people kind of choose them to carry that knowledge. And with Native people specifically, you don't go up and say, all right, um, uncle, I really want to know this. Like. Can you tell me this? Can you tell me that? It's sort of a moment where they have to deem you worthy in a way. Universally, it kind of happens where you're just kind of hanging around with people. Like specifically, um, Lewis Grassroot, remember? Not my uncle Jake Little, but uh, Lewis Grassroot from Lower Brule Sioux Tribe. He was at my talk at the American Indian Studies Association over in University of New Mexico. And he came up to me uh, and said, well, I really like the work you're doing. And um, oh, let me get your phone number. And it wasn't until about like a month later he texted me. And we like exchanged a few texts and just like chit chatting. And then after like an hour, he's like, well, if you have any questions, let me know. So they have to really get a feel for you and get to know you first before you try to attain this knowledge. And it turned out we are, we know mutual people. His sister, I believe, married somebody from the Agua Caliente Bandicuya Indians. And I do bird songs with the, the um, a relative of the person that uh, he married. So, uh, Mitakuya Yasin's uh, phrase, we are related in Lakota language. And it's very true, it came full circle. And he was in Palm Springs just uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's pretty crazy that the, I don't know, more than out of worldly explanations for Lakota knowledge, it's, it seems mystical or not, but it's a very big lived reality that Native people, and specifically the Shetishakoan, live through.